for the end. All right, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sasha. So yeah, so we're gonna talk this morning about something we're doing, all doing a lot more of than we ever thought we'd be doing, prone positioning in the acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome. So please do um, uh, go ahead and uh, interrupt with questions if you have any. So here's just a quick outline of this very short talk. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about why it is that patients with ARDS are hypoxemic and what it is that we normally do about that, say with the ventilator. Spend a couple minutes talking about the physiology of prone positioning and why it might combat those mechanisms of hypoxemia more effectively sometimes than uh, maneuvers you can make on the vent. Benefit of prone position in clinical trials. And here I'm really only going to talk about one trial, that's Proceva, which is a large multi-centered trial of prone position in ARDS. We'll talk a little bit about practical matters, complication, complications, contraindications, and duration of proning, which is something that comes up on IC rounds a fair amount. And then this last topic, not totally an ICU topic, more a floor topic, but I'll spend just a couple of minutes talking about prone positioning uh, for awake patients, which is something that we've, uh, as, as most of you all know, have, have rolled out across the hospital. Uh, so uh, let's just start with uh, hypoxemia in ARDS. So this small picture here uh, on the left is from the now uh, canonical Ware and Mate article in the New England Journal showing uh, a normal uh, alveolus uh, on uh, on my left here and um, with uh, its normal uh, uh, epithelial cells and uh, the type one epithelial cells and then the uh, type two cells here. This is the cell that the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 has a tropism for. In the setting of an inflammatory insult such as a viral pneumonia, um, you get uh, leakiness of the uh, alveolar alveolar uh, capillaries, leakiness of the endothelial layer, leakiness of the epithelial layer, fluid and plasma proteins and inflammatory cells moving into the air spaces, inactivation of surfactant. And the effect of that is that um, the stability of this alveolus is affected. And by that, I mean the pressure required to open it is increased. So here's a pressure volume plot uh, pressure on the horizontal axis, volume on the vertical axis. And here's a normal pressure volume curve of a normal lung. You add a little bit of pressure, you get a little bit of volume. And in the setting of ARDS, it takes much more pressure to get any volume. So we have this shift uh, of the pressure volume curve and a decrease in this slope or a decrease uh, in the compliance. And so that's represented by this CT scan here. Crucially, the, uh, the process is heterogeneous. So here we have uh, uh, this gasless compartment down here, this posterior collapsed lung, which uh, at normal breathing pressures uh, doesn't have any volume, so a gasless compartment. And the normal lung up here, the so-called baby lung, which may be uh, inflated or even overdistended at normal uh, transpulmonary pressures and normal breathing pressures. The significance of that is as ventilation decreases for fixed perfusion, the ventilation perfusion ratio changes, and it's the ventilation perfusion ratio which determines the partial pressure of oxygen in these air spaces, and that ultimately determines the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. So here's a, um, a representation of that. So here on the horizontal axis, I've got VQ ratio, and here alveolar partial pressure of O2 and CO2, and what you see is as the V2 ratio goes down, the alveolar PO2 uh, goes down with it. And so we end up uh, in circumstances where you have some ground glass, for instance, here with VQ mismatch or a decrease in ventilation relative to perfusion. And in this gasless compartment here, fully developed shunt, which is to say any blood that goes here never encounters air and comes out on the arterial side with the mixed venous partial pressure of oxygen. So VQ mismatch and shunt are the primary mechanisms of hypoxemia. And we can combat those with positive pressure ventilation, uh, in particular with PEEP or positive indexpiratory pressure. So here's another representation of a pressure volume curve. And here's, that, here's the pressure volume curve. If you've got a lung unit that's down here in that gasless compartment, if you add pressure, you can move up the pressure volume curve. You can take it from this completely shunt to a little bit better uh, uh, inflated. But the process is heterogeneous. So if you add that same PEEP at the airway opening, you can take this well distended uh, 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 alveolus, which is maybe in the baby lung, and cause it to be over distended. So while you are reducing VQ mismatch and shunt, you're also potentially causing lung injury. And this is the crucial problem uh, with the disease. This is why we limit tidal volumes, for instance. This is why we carefully titrate PEEP to things like driving pressure and plateau pressure. Um, one of the real beauties of prone positioning is that it enables us 
to, um, to do that recruitment to increase ventilation, to decrease those low VQ units, improve VQ mismatch, reduce shunt without causing the, uh, the over distension. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about the physiology of the prone position so that we, uh, we can see how that might work. Let's see here. So here's a normal lung in the, uh, in the upright position. Um, this applies in the supine position as well, but it's exaggerated in the upright position. So top of the lung, bottom of the lung, and outside the lung, of course, is the pleural pressure. The transpulmonary pressure or the pressure distending the lung is the difference between the airway opening pressure and the pleural pressure. But the pleural pressure is not the same everywhere in the lung. The pleural pressure, say at FRC, uh, at sort of the resting volume of the respiratory sy system is set by the balance between the natural inward elastic recoil of the lung and the outward elastic recoil of the chest wall. And the inward elastic recoil of the lung is less in the bottom of the lung. And that's for the very sensible reason that the bottom of the lung has to hold the weight of the rest of the lung. And so these uh, uh, air spaces down at the bottom will be uh, squished down a little bit. That will be exaggerated in the setting of air gas where the lung becomes edematous uh, and heavy, and that means that the pleural pressure will be less, and the transpulmonary pressure will be less, and the volume will be less. Another key fact to keep in mind is that the lung is not anatomically symmetric with respect, with respect to the uh, dorsal ventral axis, which is to say that there's more lung in the back of you than there is in the front of you. So if you're in the supine position, you have a large portion of your lung that's represented by these uh, less inflated uh, alveoli uh, down here. It's also true that there's a gravitational gradient of perfusion, um, and you might think that, that the supine and prone position would be relatively uh, equivalent with respect to that, because obviously when you're in the prone position, you're going to be sending more blood to the front of you, and, and you would think less to the back of you, and when you're in the prone position, uh, vice versa. Um, this is a, a, a MRI study of uh, perfusion in uh, normal individuals from Kim Prisk back in uh, 2007 from JAP. And what you see is that when you go from the supine to the prone position, there is an overall increase in perfusion. We've got a shift along the perfusion axis here. So this is height above dependent lung, and this is perfusion on the horizontal axis. But that this is not occurring the same everywhere, uh, everywhere in the lung. So these uh, blue black and red lines here represent different sagittal slices. So lateral is a slice of the lung over by your arm, uh, middle is in the middle of your chest, and central is over by the sternal surface. And you see that the increase in perfusion is exaggerated in the central part of the lung. And so what's going on here is that as you move the mediastinum, which is heavy and is contributing to squishing down those posterior lungs, from lung in the supine position to sternum in the prone position, you get recruitment of this central and middle portion of the lung that releases hypoxemic vasoconstriction and you get an increase in perfusion. So what happens in the prone position, you're recruiting the squished alveoli in the back, you're getting continued fairly large amounts of perfusion to the posterior lung and over mostly from moving the mediastinum and causing recruitment and release of hypoxemic vasoconstriction and overall you've had a, a increase uh, in in bq you've had better bq matching and uh and improved oxygenation and crucially the recruitment that you have accomplished uh by switching the gravitational gradient and moving the mediastinum onto the sternum has been done without causing any over distension as you might have done had you accomplished that same recruitment with P. It's also true, and this is kind of a busy slide, so I'm going to kind of go through it slowly, that there is a more homogeneous distribution of stress in the prone position. And what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that, uh, that the junction between well inflated and underinflated or not inflated lung is a place that's particularly prone to lung injury. And so if you have a heterogeneous distribution of stress, which is the transpulmonary pressure, then you have um, a potential for heterogeneous inflation and lung injury. These junctions are so-called stress multipliers and they can propagate lung injury. And so what we're gonna go through here is, is the basis for why prone positioning might also prevent lung injury in addition 
ventilator-induced lung injury in addition to improving oxygenation. So this uh, sort of uh, pyramid triangle shape here represents the lung and the cylinder represents the chest cavity and the chest cavity and the lung, if they were separate from each other, wouldn't necessarily have the same shape, but you obviously have to squeeze your lung into your chest cavity. And so if we start here in the supine position, ignoring gravity for a minute, I take this triangle and I squeeze it into the cylinder. And in order to fit in there, I have to, I have to um, deform these pieces down at the base and I have to expand these pieces up at the apex. And so what you see is that the lung units in the apex of the triangle get expanded and the ones in the bases get, uh, get squished down a little bit. If you then add a gravitational gradient on top of that, uh, that acts in the same direction as the distortion due to fitting in the chest cavity. So now these uh, inferior lung units get squeezed down even more. And so if you look at a gas tissue ratio, so basically a measure of inflation versus lung height, um, what you see is that you get more inflation, a lower gas tissue ratio as you get higher in the lung, and that's worse in ARDS than it is normally, again, because the lung itself is heavier. In the prone position, the distortion associated with fitting the lung in the chest cavity and the gravitational gradient act uh, in, uh, in opposite directions. So here I, I flip over my lung, I uh, flip over my cylinder, and I squeeze uh, the lung into the cylinder. I uh, squish down the air spaces or the alveolar at the bases and expand the ones uh, at the apex. But now gravity is decreasing the ones that were expanded at the apex and I end up with an overall more homogeneous distribution of inflation and stress. And that's represented here when you look at the gas tissue ratio versus, versus lung height, this is a more horizontal line. So in summary, the prone position has a number of physiologic benefits that might be particularly, um, particularly desirable in the setting of ARDS. You get recruitment of posterior lung, thereby you decrease shunt and improve arterial oxygenation. And you do this with continued perfusion of the posterior lung, so you get improved VQ. You get the mediastinum supported by the sternum. That's one of the mechanisms of the recruitment of posterior lung. And you get less heterogeneous inflation. So overall, you get improved oxygenation with less overdistension. So that's the principle for why we might think that prone uh, prone positioning would be beneficial in the setting of ARDS. And we actually have some fairly high quality clinical trial data to demonstrate that that is in fact, uh, that, that is in fact the case. So this is uh, the, uh, the title page from uh, the PROCEVA trial, Prone Positioning in Severe Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. This was a multi-center randomized controlled trial uh, in Europe which tested prone positioning versus uh, lung protective uh, Lung protect, traditional lung protective ventilation. Um, this is roughly 466 patient, 66 patients with severe ARDS defined as P to F less than 150, uh, and they were randomized to prone position versus traditional low tidal volume ventilation. And I just wanna talk a little bit about the prone protocol because our criteria for proning in our ICUs right now is really based on the PRECEVA criteria. So these are patients who had ARDS, uh, intubated for less than 36 hours, that's less important for us, but they underwent a 12 hour period of stabilization, which is to say they weren't prone right when they hit the unit. There were attempts to stabilize them with traditional ventilator, ventilator maneuvers, including PEEP. And then if at the end of that period of stabilization, they had a P to F less than, less than 150 on a PEEP greater than or equal to five, and an FiO2 greater than 0.6 on lung protective ventilation, then they were eligible for inclusion and randomization, and they were either randomized to supine position or prone position. And in the PRECEVA trial, this was done for at least 16 hours per day. So this time course of 16 hours per day, and, and uh, many of y'all will be aware that in our, that in our protocol, we say uh, it should be uh, switching position QAM, so longer than 16 hours. But the point of this time course was never to limit the amount of time in the prone position, it was to guarantee enough time in the prone position to ensure an adequate dose of prone. And I'll say a little bit more about that when we get to some of the contraindications and complications and more practical aspects uh, of prone ventilation. In the prone position, it was uh, standard low, lung protective ventilation, low tidal volumes. Uh, aiming for what at that time were the usual ARDSnet oxygenation goals. Um, there was uh, sedation and analgesia and neuromuscular blockade. 
the protocol did encourage neuro neuromuscular blockade, but not by any means, it was not all in patients who receive continuous neuromuscular blockade, and our own protocol does not insist on continuous neuromuscular blockade. Um, and then uh, supine position was tried, uh, you know, after at least 16 hours in prone, and if the P to F was greater than 150 on a PEEP of less than or equal to 10 and an FiO2 of less than or equal to 0.6, prone positioning could be discontinued. Um, that was uh, at, at the end of a uh, um, uh, trial of supine position, which was two to four hours, but prone position could be resumed at any time during that trial of supine position if the patient's oxygenation uh, was, not, was not meeting goals. And then there's some details about how they weaned those patients from ventilation. So that was the PERCEVA trial, and here's the key outcome. So this is a, um, a cumulative probability of survival versus days in the prone group and the supine group. And what you can see is a substantial mortality benefit that starts early. There's very early separation of these curves. And I want to point out that as far as ARDS trials, despite the large number of them we've done, uh, many of things that people continue to suggest we retry uh, in the setting of COVID-19, there's only two that show an unambiguous mortality benefit. That's low tidal volume ventilation, ARMA or ARDSnet-1, and prone ventilation. So this is a substantial mortality benefit. It's a very strong signal, stronger than most interventions that we have for ARDS. Um, and so this is something that, um, that needs to be taken seriously. Um, let me talk a little bit about sort of um, practical aspects of prone position, complications, contraindications, uh, and duration. So there are a few absolute uh, contraindications to prone position, obvious ones, unstable spine, uh, unstable sternum, uh, several things that, um, that come up uh, on, on occasion um, as potential complications. People do worry about pregnancy. Pregnancy is not a contraindication. To prone, uh, to prone ventilation, and this is something that we've worked on with our colleagues from maternal fetal medicine, and they have their own critical care guideline for pregnant patients with COVID-19, which encourages prone ventilation. Sometimes uh, in latter stages of pregnancy, third trimester, there can be you know, some positioning and padding issues to, to ensure comfort propping up the chest, but there is, is no stage of pregnancy which is an absolute contraindication to prone position. Lines are not an absolute contraindication. You know, this occasionally comes up chest tubes, fem, fem lines. Uh, we have prone patients with fem lines. We have prone patients with chest tubes. Um, you know, obviously, you want to be careful of those lines during the proning procedure itself. Fem lines can become compressed and kinked in the prone position. Um, so you, you might consider those a relative contraindication. And the way to approach that is what's the actual uh, sort of acute dependence on those vascular access catheters. If you have severe hemodynamic instability, if you have a, pla a patient who's on very, very high doses of pressors, which are all running into that fem line, well, you consider the risk of benefit of, of prone positioning. But those are in the category of relative contraindications. They're not absolute contraindications uh, to prone, uh, prone positioning. What is the duration of proning? So um, let's talk about this for a minute. So in our own protocol, uh, we recommend supine and QAM rather than the 16 hour uh, prone and then four hour supine that was in Perceva. And why is that? Well, you can imagine, you know, it does take some attention to the proning procedure. Our protocol calls for five personnel to do proning and uh, we have a proning team that can come do this because it does take a, a, a certain number of people to safely con uh, accomplish a change in position in a critically ill patient. Um, and so uh, you, want to, uh, you want to be sure that that can be done in a controlled way. And so if you're doing this 16 hour period, what happens is you might start that patient in the prone position in the morning, and then it's 16 hours, and then the next day it's four hours supine, and then another 16 hours, and you end up with that time hitting, the time for a trial of supine position, for instance, hitting at odd hours of the day. Um, and that can be inconvenient and it can be, you know, the, the personnel might not be available. So we say just QAM, it does not matter uh, whether it's exactly 24 hours or exactly 16 hours, just do it in the morning uh, when uh, you think that patient can be, safely, can be safely proned and there's plenty of personnel around. And again, the time limit in Proceva was to ensure an adequate dose of prone, not to limit uh, the amount of time that was spent in prone position. Um, and you don't have to worry, you know, if, if you think it's unsafe to switch your patient because 
they're desetting with turns or whatever and de-recruiting, you can do prolonged prone ventilation. So this is an old trial from Journal of Critical Care in 2009, looking at periods of prone ventilation, 30, 40, 60 hours. There were no increases in complications. Anecdotally, centers that are more experienced with proning than our own, such as Hopkins and Denver, have done very prolonged periods. And in the current outbreak of COVID-19, we have experience with doing four or five days of prone ventilation without any without any contraindication. So if if it's you know, if it's that next morning and you don't think it's safe to prone your patient, it's fine to wait. Prolonged periods of prone ventilation are in fact safe. Here's just a quick uh, summary of, uh, and I know we're uh, I'm getting down to the last uh, five to 10 minutes here, of the way that we recommended this work. So um, when a patient is initially intubated, all patients get an initial peep of eight to 10 centimeters of water, and we see if they stabilize. This is analogous to that 12-hour period of stabilization in Perceva. If after that period of stabilization, that initial uh, peep, um, and it doesn't have to be 12 hours, but if they're not stable on that initial peep, then make an attempt to uh, to, to optimize the PEEP, either with a formal best PEEP trial by title compliance or the ARTSnet low PEEP table. So get one shot at this to optimize PEEP. And then if your patient is still not meeting criteria by which we mean P to F less than 150 on an FiO2 of greater than six, then that patient should be prone. Don't do multiple best PEEP trials. Uh, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go directly to prone ventilation. Um, you may repeat the PEEP titration in the prone position because of that recruitment of posterior lung, PEEP often goes down in the prone position, then supine uh, QAM. And we have said because when you switch to the supine position, you may de-recruit in that uh, posterior portion of the lung. So can, if, particularly if the PEEP has gone down in the prone position, consider bringing it back up, maybe half of the, of the decrease in PEEP added back prior to the supine position to stabilize against recruitment and then a P to F is greater than 150 and we've said on a PEEP less than eight you, um, uh, and an FiO2 less than 0.6, you don't necessarily have to return to the, uh, to the prone position. So initial period of stabilization, just like in Perceva, with, it, with one attempt at uh, personalization of PEEP at the initial sort of one size fits all PEEP doesn't, doesn't work, but then don't keep trying to do that. Go directly to prone ventilation. It has a substantial mortality benefit. Uh, as you guys have seen. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about prone positioning for awake patients. So here's some pictures from an Italian article in Journal of Critical Care in 2015. They have a lot more experience with prone ventilation uh, in Europe. This is a patient who's in the ICU in helmet CPAP in the prone position. This patient has a more traditional non-invasive positive pressure uh, ventilator. And you can do this uh, in awake patients uh, on the floor. This is the benefits of, of the Italian trial that they did um, about 15 patients prone position and then looking at oxygenation here. So uh, um, with changes uh, pre-prone, prone and, uh, and post-prone. Um, and these are separated into patients who are on non-invasive and no respiratory device, but all comers increase in PDF in the prone position, um, which uh, you lose a little bit in the supine position. Uh, no complications. This is our own awake prone position protocol for MGH. Again, you, uh, um, a little bit more contraindications because here we're depending on patients to do their own proning. We don't have a proning team coming in and a passive patient. So relative contraindications here are delu delirium, confusion, inability to independently change position, recent nausea or vomiting. Um, advanced pregnancy, again, not an absolute contraindication. It can be uncomfortable and we're encouraged. Th these are awake patients. So we're trying to um, encourage uh, patients to stay in the prone position. Minimal equipment needed. We're saying any patient with respiratory sy symptoms in COVID-19, one hour on admit of prone position with respiratory rate and uh, arterial saturation recorded pre and post, and then encouraged to be in the prone position more often than not thereafter. And then a patients who experience respiratory distress or an increase in their oxygen requirement, um, we're recommending that they be placed in the prone position for one hour with careful monitoring consultation consulting of nursing supervisors and seniors because those patients may in fact be on their way uh, to, uh, to intubation. Um, these protocols for prone position, our critical care protocol, our summary uh, figure for both the PEEP titration and general critical care management are available in Apollo. And um, uh, the protocols for prone position both in the ICU, how it's accomplished with five personnel in the ICU, um, and also on the floor are available on Apollo. And then I will stop uh, there, and um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen.
and take any questions in the last like three minutes I think we have. Thanks so much, Corey. That was awesome. Um, if you guys have questions, please type them into the chat. So far, um, Corey, somebody's wondering, um, because on our imaging that we have on these patients, uh, we've noticed that uh, the infiltrates seem to be kind of lateral and peripheral. Um, is there any thinking about lateral positioning being better than prone? No, lateral positioning is not better than, pro than prone position. And um, I will point out that while it's tempting to look at CT scans or chest X-rays and look at posterior consolidation and say that that patient will benefit from prone, there were no uh, imaging requirements or imaging screening in Proceva. That mortality benefit is all comers with P to F less than 150. And as we went through in, in the physiology, most of the, ben the benefit here, or a lot of the benefit, uh, is associated with moving the mediastinum onto the sternum. So in the lateral position, you don't get the full benefit from that. So uh, don't try to tailor your position to your CT scan. Uh, the prone position is associated with more homogeneous distribution of stress that will prevent ventilator-induced lung injury and shift of the mediastinum onto the sternum, which will assist in that posterior recruitment and improving perfusion to that greater volume of posterior lung. So prone position, not lateral decubitus position. Perfect. And then for COVID patients with mild respiratory symptoms who are isolating at home, um, should we be advising them to adopt certain sleeping or sitting positions? Um, sure. I mean, tummy time is good for everyone, probably. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, I will point out that, that the trial data that we had is in innovated ARDS patients with PDS less than 150. Um, it stands to reason that some of these benefits um, will work. The, the PRISC study that I showed, which showed a redistribution of, of perfusion and, and, and ventilation, did not show substantial changes in respiratory system compliance. Uh, that was in normal, uh, no, uh, normal individuals. And so um, uh, you're normally, particularly in younger individuals, your, your lung is fully and homogeneously inflated and you don't have a lot of posterior collapse. So at some point, patients are mildly ill enough that they may not they may not benefit, but it's unlikely that they will be harmed. So I think encouraging prone position, uh, prone position is fine. Um, we don't have trial data on that. And the more mildly affected patients are, the less impairment of ventilation they have, the less likely I think you would, you would be to demonstrate a mortality benefit. Awesome. And then some, um, some of the kind of reluctance on the floors uh, or in the ICs rather for prolonged proning times um, mm -hmm. is due to concerns for kind of facial trauma or facial edema. And so what kind of strategies um, are recommended to avoid this, um, this issue? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out by giving sort of a flippant answer. We, <laughs> uh, we, we routinely leave patients in the supine position for weeks in the ICU and we don't give them breaks in the prone position. I mean, we just don't, right? And so yes, there, there will be, uh, there will be um, risk for skin breakdown in patients who aren't moving, and that will be on the dependent side of that patient. Um, you know, careful positioning, uh, the protocol uh, for the innovative paralyzed patients does call for you know, placing cushioning and stuff appropriately, careful assessment, uh, of skin breakdown and padding of it when you're doing those trials in the supine position, just like you would in a patient in the supine position, you do need to be pay careful attention to risk for skin um, uh, breakdown uh, in, in a patient who's not moving and is just lying in, in one position. So yeah, you need to pay attention to that. I don't think it's true that, that, that there is a particularly exaggerated severe risk of that in the prone position. And I base that on the fact that um, there haven't been a lot of severe consequences, you know, some, obviously some minor um, skin breakdown does occur in the prone position and you have to pay attention to that, but it's not a terribly dangerous procedure. Perfect. Um, there's a question about um, kind of the effects of the diaphragm, that the diaphragm moves more significantly in the, in the posterior portion of the, or kind of the uh, dorsal part of the diaphragm than the anterior part of uh, movement. And does that uh, explain some of the recruitment and ventilation of the posterior por yeah, portions there's, of the lung? Yeah, there's some changes in, uh, in the position of the diaphragm and that can help a little bit. The predominant effect is due to the mediastinum. Okay. Um, uh, somebody's asking about whether um, there has been any consideration for an RCT of proning floor patients um, and uh, whether other institutions are proning patients on the floor. Yeah, so we're working on putting together a, a, a 
RCT of proning floor patients. Um, we're sort of working and getting the IRB application put together that, you know, in our spare time, we're doing that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, and other institutions are doing the same. Uh, you know, I, my, my guess is that uh, uh, folks at other institutions are gonna get there before we are, but we're trying very hard to get that together. Uh, the rumor is that Hopkins has a manuscript that's in preparation, uh, so they're ahead of us. But we hope to get uh, get that that rolled out, and we hope to get that uh, through the IRB in the next uh, in the next several days. So hopefully, we will have a randomized controlled trial. I think we need a randomized controlled trial, particularly of those sort of rescue prone patients, because I personally have equipoise about whether proning those patients with an increasing FiO2 uh, is beneficial and reduces intubations, or just delays an inevitable intubation. And it's probably a little of both. Yeah. Um, and then there's a question about how we've been noticing more post extubation strider, particularly in patients yep. who had been prone, and if there's anything to be done that we can do to avoid it, or if it's just one of the risks. So, so first of all, it's not true. It's not necessarily. I, I don't know that if that's particularly increased in patients who are prone. There've been a couple no, notable cases of extubation failure in patients who never did get prone. So it may be that 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 that's increased with prone physician. But I would I would point out that the big uh, risk factors for, um, for post-extubation strider are uh, ventilation greater than 36 hours is a risk factor for post-extubation strider. Our mean duration of mechanical ventilation in COVID-19 patients is now around 12 days. So all of these patients are going to be at high risk for post-extubation strider and whether or not the prone physician contributes to that, it's certainly possible, but it's by no means established. I would also point out that there are a couple of other changes in addition to a frequency of prone positioning. There are a number of other things that we're doing differently in these patients that we know will contribute to a higher incidence of post extubation strider. One of those is these very slow peep weans. You know, um, uh, those of you who, who rounded in the ICU prior to COVID-19 know that our protocol was to do an SBT every day to potentially do a zero over zero SB, SBT on patients who were on minimal to moderate levels of pressure support. And now we're doing these things, you know, you round on COVID-19 patients now and like, okay, well, today the plan is going to be to decrease the PEEP from eight to five, and then we'll see how they do. And then tomorrow we'll, we'll maybe do an SBT. So we're doing these prolonged PEEP weans and that's totally appropriate. Intubation is a non-trivial procedure. We want to minimize uh, um, re-intubations and so we want to be absolutely sure that our patients are ready to extubate but that will prolong ventilation and that will increase the incidence of post-extubation strider. We've gone to routinely giving steroids to these patients in the peri-extubation peri uh, period something like uh, 20 milligrams of solumedrol Q4 for 12 hours prior to extubation and that's because all of our patients would qualify as high risk for post-extubation uh, strider uh, by pre-COVID-19 criteria, and that's irrespective of prone ventilation. Great. And then just one other question about, um, you know, the Perceva trial, um, uh, prone to patients kind of early in their course. And sometimes, as you said, you know, these patients are intubated for 12 days and five days in their P to F ratio and oxygenation parameters kind of would meet, quote unquote, meet the criteria for proning and whether people have looked at proning later into a, a course of intubation and what, what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, so Perceva is, is I mean, I think it, it is worth mentioning that Perceva is not a trial of prone ventilation as a rescue therapy, right? Perceva is a trial of prone ventilation as an upfront therapy in, uh, in severe ARDS. That said, the sort of physiologic benefits that we went through are unlikely to be specific to a time course in the disease, and prone ventilation likely prevents ventilator-induced lung injury. So if you've had a patient who has decompensated and shown, and shown you that they're likely to remain innovated or they're likely having that alveolar instability, which is the pathophysiologic uh, correlate of the disease, then yeah, they probably can benefit from prone ventilation, although as, as the questioner points out, we don't have trial data on that. Great, that's awesome. I think those are all the questions. Thank you so much, Corey, that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, join us again tomorrow morning at 7.15 and our, our talk tomorrow morning is on ECMO. Thanks, Sasha. <laughs> Bye everyone, stay safe. <laughs>